This is Jose Merino, Editor-in-Chief of the Neurology Family of Journals. The Neurology Podcast provides practical information to neurologists and other clinicians to help them provide better care for their patients. Thanks for listening and have a great week. Hello, it's Liz Kuhn at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and the Neurology Podcast. On this week's featured article interview podcast, I'm speaking with Mitchell Miglas. Mitch is a neurologist who's both an autonomic and sleep expert. He is the first author of an article in this week's issue of Neurology titled Frequency of Orthostatic Hypotension in Isolated REM Sleep Behavior Disorder, the North American Prodromal Synucleinopathy Cohort. In this study, Mitch and his collaborators evaluated patients enrolled in the NAPS Consortium and evaluated the frequency of orthostatic hypotension in patients with REM sleep behavior disorder, as well as clinical features unique to this group. Mitch, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Liz. So before we dive in and get into specifics regarding this article, what would you say is the most important clinical message? I think there are two important clinical messages that we try to emphasize in this article. Number one is that orthostatic hypotension is incredibly common in isolated REM sleep behavior disorder. And by our measurements, we found this condition in up to one in four patients with isolated REM sleep behavior disorder. And then number two is that despite the high frequency of orthostatic hypotension in patients with RBD, not all patients are reporting symptoms of this condition. They may not report symptoms of lightheadedness or other symptoms of orthostatic intolerance. And so this might suggest a lack of symptom awareness which makes it even more important for neurologists and sleep clinicians to have a low threshold to test for OH in the clinic. As we all know, there's increased morbidity and even mortality associated with this condition. And I want to hear more about this connection between orthostatic hypotension and REM sleep behavior disorder. Why is it so important? We now know that what we call isolated REM sleep behavior disorder or IRBD, this previously used to be called idiopathic REM sleep behavior disorder, which is essentially defined by a diagnosis of REM sleep behavior disorder in the absence of a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, dementia with Lewy bodies, or multiple system atrophy. In most cases of IRBD, this is a a prodromal or, or very early form of one of these other neurodegenerative conditions, and it presents up to several decades before phenoconversion. You know, the pathological protein in these conditions is phosphorylated alpha synuclein which can be deposited in contiguous fashions along central structures and peripheral neurological structures. And and we know that the REM control centers are in specific areas of the dorsal ponds. And so when synuclein is deposited there, it it basically short circuits the normal inhibition of skeletal muscle activity that occurs while we're dreaming, which allows people to act out their dreams. So we know the specific anatomical site of disruption there, we can localize it. The source of orthostatic hypotension in these patients is a little less clear, but it's also likely to be anatomical in that the synuclein also gets deposited in baroreflex control centers in the brainstem and the lateral medulla, and also in the peripheral nerves, the autonomic nerves that are responsible for blood pressure control. So you know, many of the bidirectional links between sleep and the autonomic nervous system involve these close anatomical networks that tend to be uh, disrupted by underlying diseases like the synucleinopathies. Now, you use the NAPS platform. This is a very powerful platform. Will you fill us in on the background and goals of the larger NAPS study? So NAPS, which stands for this North American Prodromal Synucleinopathy Study, it's a multi-center NIH-sponsored trial with 10 sites. Most of the sites are in the U.S. There are sites in Canada as well. And the aim is to follow several hundred individuals with isolated RBD, over three plus years to better understand really the natural history of RBD, as well as risk factors and potential biomarkers of phenoconversion. The NAPS is now in its, in its second iteration with more sites, more in-depth measurements that are being done. The typical visit for a NAPS patient usually lasts the entire day. It's a very comprehensive battery. I mean, ultimately, the goal of this trial is not only to, not only to understand the natural history, but also to serve as a patient registry for patients with isolated RBD that are interested in participating in clinical trials and disease-modifying trials once those trials are available, which I believe they will be in the next several years. 
Thank you. That's really helpful to hear more about this NAPS study. But I particularly like how it goes from discovery and sets a platform for treatment as well. When looking at the study you published, one thing I really liked was how it clearly separated patients with orthostatic hypotension and those with neurogenic orthostatic hypotension, a reduced heart rate response from the drop in blood pressure. What was the reasoning behind this approach? Well, a lot of this is standing on the shoulders of others who've done studies before us, especially in the autonomic world. And, you know, we know from this prior work investigating patients with neurogenic orthostatic hypotension, namely by the NYU group, that evaluating the heart rate response to the blood pressure fall can be quite useful and actually fairly sensitive and specific in distinguishing neurogenic from non-neurogenic OH. So a little bit of background behind this, you know, with an intact autonomic nervous system, the heart rate should increase when the blood pressure falls. And in patients with neurogenic OH, there's often a degeneration of these postganglionic sympathetic autonomic nerves. These nerves innervate both peripheral blood vessels, but also sinoatrial node of the heart. And as a result, this normal compensatory tachycardia that occurs when our blood pressure drops can be quite blunted. So, you know, based on this understanding, we use this previously validated delta heart rate over delta systolic blood pressure ratio and applied this to our patients with IRBD uh, who underwent a standardized three-minute active stand test as part of the NAPS protocol. So patients had blood pressure and heart rate measured in the supine position, and then they stood stationary for three minutes, and we measured those numbers consecutively every minute for three minutes and paid special attention to the compensatory tachycardia to distinguish neurogenic from non-neurogenic OH. As part of your study, you found no symptom difference between groups using validated autonomic symptom questionnaires. Will you clue us in on what this could mean in the clinic or the underlying mechanism? Yeah, so this is another important and somewhat surprising finding, though in retrospect, other autonomic studies have reported this same finding in those with neurogenic OH. So Perhaps it wasn't so surprising in retrospect. As you mentioned, despite the high frequency of orthostatic hypotension in, in our cohort of patients with RBD, their autonomic symptom burden, as measured by autonomic questionnaires, was no different from participants who did not have OH. So to us, this suggests either lack of, lack of symptoms or impaired recognition of symptoms in these patients. And I think it's important to remember that there is still intact cerebral autoregulation in patients with OH, where the body preferentially preserves blood flow to the brain in settings of systemic hypotension for obvious reasons. This can be why when we put these patients on the tilt table and their blood pressure drops by over 100 points systolic, they can still carry on conversations with us. Another explanation is that because of relative cerebral hypoperfusion, the recognition of the symptoms of the lightheadedness, et cetera, can be impaired. And then final explanation might be there could be some degeneration of central autonomic network structures that themselves result in impaired symptom recognition in these patients. And I'll also point out, too, that as part of the study, you excluded all patients on antihypertensives. Is that correct? Yes, we initially kept that group um, in uh, those patients that did not have OH, but after Several revisions, even though it reduced the sample size, we ended up excluding those patients just to absolutely exclude the drug effects. We excluded all medications that could affect blood pressure on the active stand test. And we also looked at antidepressant use because we know that patients with RBD, a lot of them are on antidepressants. And whether this is cause or, or consequence of the disease is unclear. But these antidepressants, some of them might work by increasing blood pressure, which potentially could have affected our results. But we did do a sub-analysis excluding those patients on antidepressants, and we found no differences in our results. I also found it interesting that patients with orthostatic hypotension had an older age of onset of REM sleep behavior disorder. So I initially questioned whether this meant that the longer patients had RBD, the more likely they were to get OH. But the data really doesn't support that. Do you think age of onset or timing of symptoms matters for these groups? It should be noted that older age, but not age of RBD onset per se, was associated with that finding in our study and specifically was only associated with change in diastolic, but not systolic blood pressure. So, you know, the clinical significance of that association is not really clear. I can say that we evaluated for 
associations with other prodromal markers, including smell and color vision and cognitive function and motor testing. And we found that no associations that strongly correlated with the presence of OH in this group. But the question I think really begs longitudinal follow-up, which is another important next step in studies like this is to see, do these findings actually predict phenoconversion rates or type of disease, Parkinson's versus Lewy body dementia versus MSA, which is really what a lot of our patients are asking. Yeah, I think that's a really important question that a lot of people in the field are looking at. And going along with that, I'm going to be a bit of a, a devil's advocate here. So you're looking at a group of patients with RBD, and about a quarter of them had orthostatic hypotension. Wouldn't that fit with the diagnosis of pure autonomic failure, or at least how we currently define patients with pure autonomic failure? Yes, this is a very important point. And you're correct in the way that we currently diagnose pure autonomic failure, which to most autonomic specialists means the presence of neurogenic orthostatic hypotension and the absence of these other conditions, Parkinson's, Lewy body, MSA. It's sort of a diagnosis of exclusion in the autonomic world, just as, as IRBD is a diagnosis of exclusion in the sleep world. And most patients with, with PAF have other manifestations of autonomic dysfunction, including GI and urinary or sweat changes. So they're not really squeaky clean, so to speak, just as most patients with isolated RBD have other prodromal symptoms as well. But it does make us rethink these definitions. Is it PAF if someone has RBD? We know that in the natural history synucleinopathy study that the NYU group spearheaded that about two-thirds of patients with PAF endorsed RBD symptoms. And now in our study, we see that about one out of four patients with RBD might have OH. So what do we call these patients? Uh, I think consensus guideline revision of, of this term pure autonomic failure is urgently needed. And I think we'll probably be working on this, you and me together and, and others in the near future. I agree. The borders of these different disorders is sort of blurred, if you will. There's certainly overlap, yet it's important for patients to have a clear diagnosis and even more important to know what they may expect looking down the road. Speaking on that phenoconversion part, then your study nicely shows ways to early diagnose patients at risk for phenoconversion to disorders with motor or cognitive involvement, like you mentioned, Parkinson's disease or dementia with Lewy bodies or multiple system atrophy. I want to hear from you. What do you think is so important about detecting these patients early? There are at least two important reasons. You know, the first is just informed decision making for us and for our patients. Most patients with these conditions want to know as much about their disease as possible. Some of this information is actionable. For in this example, in the case of orthostatic hypotension, which we can treat, we can prevent falls, we can improve quality of life. But other information is, is still unclear on how we use it. And does it inform the diagnosis or the prognosis? Because we don't really have all the research yet. But I think most importantly, early diagnosis will lead to earlier treatment, potentially with disease-modifying trials, which I believe all of us in this field think we will see within our lifetimes. And of course, all of medicine is shifting towards earlier diagnosis and earlier treatment. We're seeing this in the Alzheimer's field as well, so for obvious reasons. And I'd say what better field to investigate this than autonomic medicine and sleep medicine, where we can see markers of these diseases years and, and sometimes decades in advance. Absolutely. I agree with you completely. Well, thank you, Mitch, so much for joining us today. Congratulations on publishing this important study. It certainly was my pleasure in talking with you today. Thank you, Liz. Once again, I've been speaking with Mitch Miglas, a sleep and autonomic specialist at Stanford, about the recent paper titled Frequency of Orthostatic Hypotension in Isolated REM Sleep Behavior Disorder, the North American Prodromal Synucleinopathy Cohort. Please check out this paper in this week's issue of Neurology, and have a great week. This is Stacey Clardy, your podcast editor. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please Take a few moments to subscribe, rate, and review the Neurology Podcast through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And remember, you can always head to neurology.org backslash podcast for our full list of past episodes, where you can also search by keyword in your podcast app for any neurology-specific topics you want to learn about.